welcome to the Current Science and Technology Podcast from the Museum of Science in Boston. I'm your host, Corrine Tate, and every week we bring you interviews with guest researchers and our museum staff covering science and technology in depth. From bulletproof vests to airplanes, and even the giant ropes used to tie up cruise ships. We need super strong fibers for a range of applications, but only a handful of expensive materials like Kevlar are strong enough to fit the bill. A researcher at Northeastern University, though, has just developed a new type of super strong fiber that rivals the best out there and could be a lot cheaper to make. Here to tell us more is Dr. Marilyn Minus, an assistant professor of mechanical engineering at Northeastern University. Welcome, Dr. Minus. Thank you, Corrine. So let's start by talking about the super strong fibers that are currently out there. Well, some of the strong fibers that we have out there are Kevlar, uh, most people have heard of that, Dyneema, carbon fibers, and our natural fibers like spider silk. Kevlar is used for bulletproof vests, and so is Dyneema fibers. And carbon fibers are used in a lot of composites for cars, aircraft, spacecraft, even sporting goods like tennis rackets and golf clubs. But these are really uh, expensive materials. And spider silk is a natural material that we know is very strong, but it's not used for much than spider webs. So, so what actually makes these fibers strong? Well, what makes them really strong is their internal structure. So if you look inside the skeleton of these fibers, the molecules within the fibers are very straight along the fiber. And so what happens is that provides the fiber with a lot of strength and toughness. You say strength and toughness. Are they not the same thing? Not exactly. Uh, Strength is a measure of how much force is needed to break the material. Whereas toughness sort of tells us how far the material is going to bend whilst you're stretching it before it's going to break and and how much energy that material can absorb. So let me just make sure I understand this. So you're saying that strength is how much energy you need to put in before something will break, but toughness is how much energy can be absorbed by that material or how much it'll stretch before it breaks. Yeah, so that's exactly what I'm saying. So, for example, if you take Kevlar, which is used to make a bulletproof vest, Kevlar is very strong, and so it it, it can absorb the bullet at a very low stretching rate. In other words, it only stretches about 2% before absorbing that bullet. But if you take spider silk, which is very tough, and it's, it's actually the toughest material we have, well, first of all, the spider silk isn't as strong as Kevlar, but it can stretch quite a bit and absorb the same bullet. However, it's going to stretch about 300% before it catches it. So if you're wearing a bulletproof vest made of spider silk, that bullet's going to go through you before it actually stops. Versus with Kevlar, it's going to not go through you. And that's the benefit of having strength and toughness. I see. So both are very important in these super strong fibers. Exactly. You want a combination of properties in them. Now, we've talked a little bit about what these super strong fibers are, but there are probably some shortcomings. Why would we need or want some other types of super strong fibers? Well, there's a couple of reasons. So first of all, I only mentioned a small handful of fibers, and that's really all that's out there. So we don't have many of these strong materials to buy. And so we want more options. The other thing is that they're very expensive. Carbon fibers and Kevlar and Dyneema, these cost about $20 to $100 per pound, whereas most polymers that you can make strong fibers from only cost about $0.50 per pound. So we care about having more options, but we also want materials that cost a lot less, and that way we can use them in a lot more applications. So I understand that you've been working on addressing some of those shortcomings, basically coming up with more options and, more importantly, using materials that are a lot cheaper. So tell us a little bit about this new material that you've developed and how it's different from what's out there. Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to provide a cheaper option for making more new strong materials. And so what we do is we take typical polymers that you find in your everyday textiles, your your clothing. So when you say polymer, give us an example. So a polymer is like polyethylene, which makes your Ziploc bag or your trash bags or nylon which most of us wear clothing that's made of nylon so plastics and nylon and things like that I see so you're going to make super strong fibers from those materials exactly so the way we're trying to do that is those polymers they're very flexible chains so you can think of them as a pearl necklace very flexible materials and what we need to do to make them strong is we need to make all those pearl necklaces become straight 
And so the way that we try to do that is we incorporate nanomaterials into our polymer and we actually can use the nanomaterials to make our materials straight and that gives it the properties, the strong and tough properties that we want. And so in a way, our new material is a kind of composite material. What exactly does that mean? Well, to describe a composite, it's basically a material made up of two different things. And so I have an example where we, you think of it like a two different types of cookies. So if you look at a chocolate chip cookie or an Oreo cookie, these are two composites because what happens is they're made of two things. So a chocolate chip cookie has a chocolate chip and it has a soft cookie. And an Oreo has a hard cookie and a soft filler. And so these two are composite materials because they're made of two things, but they have an intermediate property. But the other interesting thing about these cookies is that you can actually peel out both of the components. You can eat the filler or you can have the cookie. And so with us, we have a nanomaterial, which is hard, and we have a polymer, which is soft, and we put them together and we make them work together and we make this composite. So our nanomaterial would be like the Oreo cookie yeah. on the outside, and your soft, flexible polymer is like the yummy Oreo filler. Yeah, exactly. So I we see. have these two materials that are so different, but when we put them together, we make something that's really good. Using nanomaterials in composites isn't new, though. Haven't we already used nanomaterials in these type of composites before? Yeah, actually, nanomaterials have been used in composites for the last 20 years. And what most people have done is they've used these nanomaterials to strengthen the polymer. Now, what we've been using specifically is carbon nanotubes. This is a kind of nanomaterial that you can imagine it as a long needle that's very, very strong. Most people, what they've done is they've taken it and put it into the polymer, and they've used it to make that polymer strong. And that's Because carbon nanotubes are supposed to be some of the strongest materials out there, right? Exactly. These are stronger than any material that we know, and in fact, they're about 30 times stronger than steel. Wow. And so it gives you an idea how strong they are. And so most people have tried to use them as the strong part. What we're doing is we're trying to use these nanomaterials, and we're trying to make the polymer act like the nanomaterial. So when you put them together, the polymer actually wants to become a straight needle just like the nanotube. And when you have the polymer being like a straight needle next to the nanotubes, which are like straight needles, the effect is, is compounded and you have a stronger material? Exactly. So as I mentioned a lot earlier, when we have Kevlar and, and these very strong fibers, their molecules are straight like needles. But these flexible chains, these cheap polymers that we're using, they're not like that. And so when we can get the nanomaterial to cause the polymer chain to straighten out just like it, we actually make the polymer stronger on its own. And we only have to use a very small amount of nanomaterials to do this. So tell me a little bit about how you're actually making these fibers. How do you get the polymers to line up with the nanotubes? What we do is we mix the nanomaterial into the polymer. And what you get out is sort of like a goop that's kind of like honey. And we take this and we actually flow it down a tube. And what that does is when you flow it down this tube, it causes these this honey to form a fiber. And you can think of fibers forming as just like when you cook spaghetti, a very like you know wobbly kind of spaghetti that you get you get these fibers that are like that and what happens is the fiber is filled with the nanomaterial these flexible polymers as well as some some different liquid that we have in there just for spinning purposes and then we keep stretching that spaghetti strand until it gets thinner and thinner and what's happening in the process is you have the the polymer that's straightening out because the nanomaterial is in there and so these nanomaterials they're already straight and so they act as a template and allow these polymer chains to straighten out with them as we stretch this fiber. And so the end result is we have a very, very strong and tough fiber with very uh, straight polymer chains as well as a small amount of nanomaterial. So the end result of the is a fiber that's very tough and very strong. Let me just reiterate to make sure I understand. In this solution, you have these flexible polymers and you have your straight nanomaterials. And as you stretch and stretch and stretch, the polymer, it's getting straighter and straighter and straighter because those straight nanomaterial molecules are in there acting as a template, kind of guiding everything along into the same type of straight shape. And the more straight molecules you have, the stronger and tougher your material. Exactly. We're talking about these fibers being strong, but just how strong are they? Well, actually, the, the fibers that we've been making are just as strong, if not stronger, than Kevlar. 
And so what we've made so far has strength that is higher than Kevlar and even toughness that's higher than Kevlar. And it's actually approaching fibers, that the best fiber we have on the market today, which is called Xylon. So these fibers that you've made are already comparable to the best of the best that's out there. Well, how are we going to use these fibers then? Well, they can be used for lots of different applications. So most of the strong fibers, like I said, they're used for aircraft, spacecraft, sporting goods. But because we're trying to give cheaper options, we hope that these can be used in even our everyday vehicles in order to make them lighter so we use less fuel. They should be able to use in more of our sporting goods to make them stronger, things like tennis rackets and baseball bats and all these things that we want to make lighter, stronger, so that we can do more with them. They also can be used for building materials as well. That's great. So by making these super strong materials out of some out of a cheaper starting material, we can end up using it in a lot more applications just because it becomes affordable. Exactly. So most people have heard of the more expensive fibers out there, but nobody gets to use them because they cost so much. And now we're trying to provide new options so we can everybody can enjoy these materials. Now, what's next for your research? We're working on a few things. We're actually funded right now by the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, and so they're concerned about learning how to make these very strong materials for future aircraft and future spacecraft and space applications. So we're definitely focused on that. But now that we see the potential of using these very cheap polymers to make strong fibers, what we also want to do is open this up to a wide variety of very, very inexpensive polymers in order to see what we can do to make composite materials that are super strong available to the masses. That's pretty amazing, first of all, to think that your super strong materials could be headed for outer space, uh, but also that they're going to be made cheaper and accessible to more and more people in more and more different products. Thank you, Dr. Minus, for sharing your research with us today. Thank you for having me. That's it for this week's show, but be sure to come back next time for more of the latest in science and technology. podcast is a production of Current Science and Technology at the Museum of Science in Boston, part of the Boston community for over 175 years. For more information, visit our website at www.mos.org slash podcasts or email us at podcast at mos.org. Thanks for listening.